So in the last few videos, we've talked about cache coherence protocols, and I'll now move on to a different but related and highly confusing topic of consistency models. Okay, so before I start, let me do a quick recap of what guarantees the, the coherence protocol is going to provide, and then I'll explain why, why we need this notion of a consistency model as well to explain what the program is going to do. Okay, so firstly, uh, coherence ensures two conditions. The first is right propagation, and the second is right serialization, right? This is right serialization, and the first one is uh, right propagation. Okay, so right serialization tells me that if I write, say, a 5 into x from one thread, and a different thread writes, say, a 7 into x, then the protocol is going to ensure that every thread sees these two writes in exactly the same order. Okay, so everyone is perhaps first going to see the write of 5, followed by the write of 7. Okay? But the protocol makes no guarantees about writes to different locations. So if one thread were to write a 5 into A, and a different thread were to write a 7 into B, then there's no guarantee being provided about you know, how these writes are seen by different threads. Okay, one thread could see the write of A first, and then the write of B, and a different thread could see, in, see it in, in, um, in exactly the opposite order. Okay, so the coherence protocol does not make any guarantees about these writes. But uh, the consistency model then goes on to specify what kinds of reorderings uh, are valid in, in the hardware. Okay? And the programmer has to have some understanding of what these reorderings are going to be. Otherwise, it's really hard to write a correct program. Okay? So this will be made more clear as I walk through some examples. So in this slide, I'm showing you three different examples. Okay? These are multi-threaded applications where you know, both the threads are dealing with the same variables and both could be you know, reading and writing these locations at the same time. Okay, and so, you know, let's walk through this and try to make some guesses about what the program outcome should be, or, you know, what is it that, that the programmer should expect the hardware to do in each of these cases. Okay, so in the first example, you know, I'm implementing mutual exclusion. So, you know, without using locks, the programmer is using some tricks to make sure that, you know, two threads cannot both execute uh, the critical section at the same time. Okay, so the way this is done is thread P1 first sets A equals 1, and this is its way of expressing its intent to get into this critical section. Similarly, P2, if it wants to get into the critical section, has to first set B equals 1. Then you check to see if the other thread is trying to get into the critical section. And if it is, then you give up. You go back up over here again and, and start, uh, start from scratch. Okay, but I'm leaving out those other if-then-else statements. Okay, so, you know, if you implement code this way, it should be impossible for both threads to get into the critical section at the same time, right? If both threads are in the critical section, it means that both have seen, you know, b equals 0 and a equals 0, and that should not be possible, right? If you, if this thread first gets into the critical section, it thinks b is 0, that means this thread is at a point earlier than b equals 1. So now, if this thread makes progress from this point on, it should see a equals 1 and not get into the critical section. Okay, so, you know, as, as a programmer, as a reasonable programmer, you would expect this code to correctly implement mutual exclusion. Anything different would, would cause you a fair bit of surprise. Okay? Now let's look at the second example over here. Initially head and data are set to 0 and then P1 first sets data equals 2000 then it sets head equals to 1. Okay? And P2 is spinning in this while loop checking to see if head is non-zero or not. Finally when it, when it sees that head is 1 it exits the while loop and the first thing it does is it reads the value of data. Okay, if it's got to this point, it means that head is 1. That means this instruction has executed, which means that, you know, data should be 2000. So the value that you read over here should be 2000. Again, the programmer would be very surprised if it saw anything but 2000. Okay, then let's look at this third example over here. Thread P1 first sets A equals 1. Thread P2, if it finds A equals 1, it goes ahead and sets B equals 1. Then thread P3 checks the value of B. If it is 1, it reads the value of A. Okay, so if you're executing this instruction over here, it means that B is 1. That means this instruction has executed. That means that A has been determined to be equal to 1. Okay, so if you read the value of A over here, you should see a 1. Again, if you see anything else, then that's going to be a huge surprise. Okay, so what we've done is we've walked through these example pieces of code and you know we've made reasonable guesses about what the outcome should be and i'm guessing that you know most most uh, most reasonable people will agree on what these outcomes are going to be okay so how did this come about you know so when we when we reason about these programs we made some inherent assumptions about how these 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 programs or how the hardware is going to behave okay and 
our intuitive model of how these programs behave is referred to as sequential consistency. Okay, and what it consists of is our assumption that within a thread you will have program order. So each thread is going to give me the is, is going to preserve program order. That is, when I execute P the thread in P1, for example, I'm going to first do data equals two thousand, and I'm then going to do head equals one. You know, I don't expect my my program instructions to be completely reordered. Okay, it might be happening in the background, but the final uh, outcome should be as if these programs executed in program order. Okay, so that's the first assumption I made. Right, that's why I said that if I've got to this point, it means head is one, and if head is one, it means you know data equals two thousand as well. Right, so inherently I was making the assumption that I could not have executed head equals one unless data equals two thousand had finished. Okay, the second assumption that a programmer usually makes is that you know each instruction executes atomically. Okay, that is you know before I do head equals one, I'm going to finish data equals two thousand in its entirety. Okay, I'm not going to start doing head equals one while data equals two thousand is still being processed in the background, right? That becomes you know really hard for the programmer to reason about you know what all is going on in the system. So we always assume that at any given point of time, only one instruction is executing. It's going to finish completely. Then I'll move on to the next. Okay, otherwise we are putting too much of a burden on the programmer to reason about you know too many flying balls in the air. Okay, so I'm making the assumption that every instruction executes atomically. And I'm not making any assumptions about you know how the different threads could proceed. Okay, so the instructions from the two different threads could be interleaved in an arbitrary manner. Okay, that is, I could first execute this instruction, then I could execute this, then I could execute this, then I could execute this, then maybe this, and so on. Right. So I so uh, I'm not making the assumption that these programs are moving in lockstep or anything. It's it's, it's uh, you know it is fair game for any thread to be making progress in the next cycle. Okay, so let me just formalize this on the next slide, right? So this model, which I just described as sequential consistency, is something that we all usually assume when we reason about a program. Okay, so we assume that within a program, uh, I'm not going to do any reordering of instructions. Then I'm going to assume that every instruction finishes to completion before I start the next. And as I said, I'm going to assume that instructions from different threads could be interleaved arbitrarily. Okay, so for example, if P1 is executing instructions with you know small letters A, B, C, D. And P2 is executing instructions with capital letters A, B, C, D. The next instruction to happen in any given cycle could be picked from either P1 or P2. Right. So these examples over here are all valid executions of this multi-threaded program. Right. So in the next cycle, in this case, I could be doing small a, then I could be doing small b, then I could be doing capital A, then small c, and so on. Right. So in any cycle, I could pick an instruction from either P1 or P2. But within P1, I'm always going to preserve program order, right? So that's why I did small a, small b, small c, small d, small e, and likewise I did you know capital A, capital B, capital C, capital D, capital E, right? So in all these examples, you'll see that within a thread, I'm preserving program order, but in the next cycle, executing an instruction from either thread is is fair. Okay, so these are all the assumptions that I usually make, and this is called the sequential consistency model. And if all of us, by default, make these assumptions about the program behavior, then maybe this is what we should go with, right? So maybe we should enforce that the hardware also provide results that are sequentially consistent, because this seemingly puts the least burden on the programmer to reason about how the program is going to behave and what outputs it's going to produce. Okay, so we are now going to enforce upon the hardware that it satisfy these three conditions. Okay, so in addition to implementing a valid cache coherence protocol, we should make sure that these three conditions are are preserved. Okay, and I'll show you what happens if any of these three conditions are are violated. So in the next video, I'll go through what happens if we violate any of these three conditions. One other thing that you'll quickly notice that if the hardware uh, if the hardware enforces each of these, you could perhaps end up with a really slow program, right? Because you're saying that each instruction should execute atomically. That is, I should take one, finish it to completion, then move on to the next. So there's absolutely no parallelism. And also, I'm preserving program order. That is, I'm not going to look at the next instruction until the first one has finished, right? So again, I can't do things like out of order execution, right? So it seems that this is going to be really slow. So you know, later I'll also show you how you can work around these constraints to provide both high performance and sequentially consistent execution.